series. It's called Believe in Hope. It's called Believe in Hope. That was something God spoke into my heart and my spirit this summer as I was asking him what he wanted to say to me as a man and what he wanted me to say to people and how he wanted to reshape things in my life. And so I've been trying to live this out. And I want to be the one with the most hope in the room. Um, I want to be the one that says hope matters. Hope makes a difference. And today's message is called Tangible, Usable, Practical Hope. Because I don't want you to think that hope is just a mindset or just an idea. Like it's just all in your mind. We want to be able to come back and say that hope is tangible and practical and usable and even edible hope. And so today, do you believe in hope? We've been walking through these five statements about hope. Number one is there is always a solution. Number two is I will always know what to do. Number three is I will thrive no matter what happens. And today we're at number four. I will always have the resources I need to do what needs to be done. Anybody here? It's funny. I have to raise your hands. It's what you're not supposed to do. So I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Anybody here ever been to one of those A meetings? A A N A C A, all those. Yeah, uh, I see that hand. Yeah. Um, okay, so you sit down and you read from their book. They have the big book, and their steps. And, and so there's people in there reading and saying these words. We came to a place where we realized that. We, our life was unmanageable, and that only a power outside of ourselves can save us. Now, I've been in those meetings, visiting with people, going as an invitation, and I'm sitting there with people who have not come to the place that they realized that their life was unmanageable and only a power outside of themselves can save them. But they're in there together going over the, the steps of AA, saying, saying it not in present tense, not, not in future tense, not I, I need to come to the realization, not saying um, I'm coming to the realization, but saying it in the past tense. Saying something in the past tense that not, has not yet happened to them yet. And so... If that's the way to get sober, if that's the way to get recovered, is to get there in my mind, in my heart, even before my body gets there, what about you and me as Christians about our hope level in our life? Can I go ahead and get there and say, today, I will always have the resources I need to do what needs to be done? And so I enter into a situation and something happens. Has anybody here ever had your resources threatened? Yeah. Now, practical, physical, tangible, edible resources. But also you've had resources of energy threatened, haven't you? You just don't have the energy for this. You have had the resources of love threatened, haven't you? Like, I don't love you anymore. You've had the resources of sickness threatened in your life. But if I can just sit down like I'm at an all-day long AA meeting and say, I will always have the resources to do what needs to be done, because for God, the future has already happened. Can, can somebody feel me on that one? There is no sense of time with God. I mean, God owns time, but then he steps outside of time. But for God, the future has already happened. And I can say in my life, I will always have the resources to do what needs to be done. And if I don't have the resources to do, to do it, it doesn't need to be done. But God, you give me my next step. I will step into the void of nothingness, believing in my heart that you will give me the resource for the very next step. I, I've heard it said this way many times. 
Often we never get the light for the next step until we've taken the next step. You just have to take the step I can see in order to get light for the step I don't see. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Philippians 4.19. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, which is one of the churches in Asia Minor, which is Turkey. And it's funny, he's writing to the place we call Turkey, talking to them about practical physical needs. That's always been about. It. But he's telling them that as they've given their offering for the suffering, persecuted Christians in Jerusalem, like the Apostle Paul is, is, is receiving an offering to take to people who are the worst off, most impoverished, most suffering Christians in all of Christianity during that time. And the people that gave the best gift to the suffering Christians were the ones who were already the most impoverished themselves. The church in Philippi, it's like their congregation was under a ban. And the more they witnessed and the more they reached out, the community began to be people who said, well, you know, we don't want Christians working for our company. We don't want those Jesus people in here with... It's not just that they're preaching. We don't like them as people was the idea. And so to become a Christian, you would lose out in your family. You would lose out economically. You could have a degree. I don't know if they had degrees, but if you had a degree and you had this ability to do something, they didn't want you doing it because you were a Christian and they, they thought of it as a subversive thing. And here are these people that couldn't have jobs because of their Christianity giving the best Biggest gift. And so, what about you and me? I mean, here the Apostle Paul is receiving this gift, and he's receiving it from hungry. He's receiving it's like receiving food from hungry people to give to people who are more hungry than the hungry people. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not all that good at receiving gifts sometimes. Because you have to be kind of humble to receive a gift. It's like, you know, I don't want charity, some people say. But here they, here they are, and the Apostle Paul receives it from them, looking in their eyes, knowing that they don't have it to give. And how can he do that? Because he believes in hope. He believes that they will have the resources they need to, to do what needs to be done. It's funny because sometimes this, per this verse is misquoted. And people say, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You know, that, that's true, but that's not the verse. The verse is, my God shall supply all your needs. It's that belief in hope for others, the Apostle Paul is saying. And so there's no hopeless circumstances, only hopeless people. You notice that some people can thrive in one circumstance and, the, uh, and that same circumstance kills somebody else. It's not how bad the circumstances are. It's about how low your hope level is in the circumstances. There are no hopeless circumstances, only hopeless people. Once someone gets true hope, the circumstances cannot stay the same. Now, when I say that, it challenges me because I start to think of like, well, what about this circumstance? And what about that circumstance? What about another circumstance? But I come back to say this. If I believe that hope is real and that hope makes a difference, that every other road besides the road that leads to hope is a dead end, that hope is the difference maker, then I'm agreeing with God with what God created to sustain me. God created hope to sustain me in unsustainable times. God created hope for me to believe something that I have a hard time believing. In 1 Corinthians 13, people know, if you've heard, read the Bible very much, you know, the Bible talks about 
There's faith, hope, and love. These three remain. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. But I can have all the belief in the world. But until it turns into hope, I don't get to feel or express love. Faith never, faith never looks like love until it first looks like hope. That good is coming. I've got a story to tell you. Anybody here ever traveled and stayed in an Airbnb? I had a couple of takers on that. Anybody else over here stayed in an Airbnb? Well, the founder of Airbnb is named Joe Gebbia. And he and his, uh, his friend Brian were there in Silicon Valley. And they had this dream to do a startup company. In fact, Joe convinced Brian to come with him and leave his apartment in Los Angeles. They had both traveled out there to kind of act for college. And what are they going to do to get jobs and have a business? And he convinced his friend Brian to move, to quit his job, and move up to Silicon Valley to be there, and then start a company. And their other friend, Nate, who was a computer programmer, had moved out, and so, you know, it's kind of this post-college roommate swap they were doing. Has anybody, anybody ever been there? <laughs> and so, uh, they're spitballing ideas that first week, and he said the first week was so fun. The first week was so exciting. At the end of the first week, he got a letter in the mail from the landlord saying, your rent has now gone up 25%. The week we decided to start a company? We don't even have a company. We're 22 years old. The rent went up 25% and they realized they didn't really even have the money to make rent the next month. You know, so if your child called you and said that, if you have children that age and said, what should I do? Go to McDonald's, get a job, get a second job. That's not what they did. These guys, uh, see, Joe had had this experience when, when, before he left home to come out to California where, where he met somebody and kind of like, he didn't really feel it all that well, but he just kind of out of the generosity of his heart, he let a stranger stay on an air mattress in his apartment. Is he college guy? Like, what do I really have to lose? Except for about midnight, he got pretty afraid and he said he locked the door. <laughs> Woke up the next morning and he, he was alive and the other guy wasn't, he really wasn't scary. You know, everything seemed scary at midnight. He said, I got up the next morning and realized that. And so, the air in Airbnb is the air mattress, is what that is. I thought it was like wireless, you know, because you use your tablet or your, get it over the internet. The air is the air mattress. And so, there they are, and the rent has gone up. What are we going to do? He said, well, let's call our other roommate, and let's get him to make a website. And there was a big conference, and they were having a hard time. They knew that, some, uh, they, knew that they wanted to go to this conference in, in their city, but they didn't have money to go to the conference, so they weren't going. It was a tech conference, and a conference about business and engineering. And, and they went to the website, and there was, all the hotels were sold out. So he remembered his air mattress friend, and he they made a website. Their other old roommate helped him make the website. That's how they got to be three guys in the company. And that website was Air Bed and Breakfast because they thought, well, we'll pick him up from the airport because you know all your friends want you to pick him up from the airport. We'll treat him like friends. We'll pick him up from the airport. We'll show him around. We'll give him a breakfast. Eighty dollars a person. Well, they had you know, three people stay for two nights at $80 a night, and they made rent. <laughs> they made rent. And so they're still thinking about it, and maybe it's in the back of their mind, but it takes quite a while to really realize, hey, this is our business. Like, while they're thinking about what business should I have, they do this other side hustle that becomes the business. Well, fast forward to about 2008. Anybody remember the big election event and who was running in 2008? Who was it? Obama and McCain. Oh, head to head. Obama and McCain. Well, they thought at first that their niche was for conferences, like, you know, because conferences sell out hotels in cities. 
Now, this was it. Well, in that fall season, you know, they had gotten a couple hundred people. and The business was kind of going. But they also had over $20,000 in credit card debt. They were funding the business of credit card debt. Joe literally says in his interview that like, it was like, you know, those like picture albums where you pull a picture and you insert all the albums and you flip the page into another one. He said, we had four or five sheets of just credit cards and we'd pull one out and rotate it, pull one out and rotate it. And they were, they were going under. They, couldn't, they, never, they never could see any light of day for this situation. Well, these are the guys that just thought, Man, this same guys who came up with the Airbnb, and, but they were dead. Like, you know, they knew they had a product that people would want because he said either people loved it and thought it was great or they hated it because, you know, strangers equal danger. I'm not staying in anybody's house. He said, good ideas always have people who love them and hate them. So you can tell a good idea. And so, he, uh, they come up with this thing. Because they're thinking about breakfast and they're getting down to it. And they go to the largest Democratic convention there's ever been. That year was Obama's convention in Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado had 30,000 hotel rooms. And there was 100,000 people coming. So this is perfect for us. And they get a lot of reservations. They get a lot of people that want to do it. And they have it going on. But they still think, now, we can't even, how are we going to even get there? We can't even, we don't have any money to get there. The election cycle is kicking. It's wild. And so, these crazy guys come up with something. Let's see if we got the picture for it. <laughs> <laughs> this is absolutely true. It sounds like I'm making this up, doesn't it? Obama owes hope in every bowl. Captain McCain Crunch, a maverick in every box. And so, Joe calls Kellogg Company, and he's giving this long spiel. Like, and we can do this, and it'll sell so much, and you know, just do this, and maybe I can sell this idea to Kellogg. And he, he talks for about, he gives his long spiel for about, his pitch for about five minutes, and at the end he says, and what do you think? Silence on the end of the phone. The person had hung up a long time ago. <laughs> so, he um, doesn't know what to do, so he thinks like, well, maybe I don't actually need cereal. So they go and just buy a bunch of, a bunch of you know, wholesale Cheerios and a bunch of wholesale um, Captain Crunch. They get those, pull them and pull the bags out of the boxes and throw away the boxes. And then he says, he finds a, a printer on Etsy, and some kind of a deal where he goes in and he, he pitches the idea, gives the same long spiel just like he did to Kellogg. He says, and I'll pay you at the end. We don't have any money. And then maybe, he, maybe he was passionate enough, or maybe he went to enough printers, or maybe it, was the, it was somehow a connection with somebody, and the printer says, yeah, I'll print them in advance for you, and you got to pay me within you know, 14 days. But I can, I'll only do 500. So this, these guys, they think only 500, only 500, only 500. How can this be hopeful, only 500? How can this be good, only 500? Like, how is this going to help, only 500? Well, Joe went to art school, and he knew that the value of a limited edition, there's only 500. Well, you could say only 500 like not very many. But if it's something amazing and you say only 500, that's a limited edition and it costs more. $40 a box. $40 a box. So they get them all printed. They put their bags of Captain McCain Crunch in there. They put their bags of Cheerios in there. And they, they head off and they, they make it in and they just start going to every business, every news outlet, everywhere, talking about we're Airbnb. And, and we have a product for the convention in Denver. It's Obama O's and Captain McCain Crunch. Well, finally, a local news outlet says, okay, we'll let you talk. Because you know how news is. I mean, there's so much news at the convention. It's such a big deal. And so they go in, and they're trying to work on their rooms for Airbnb, too. But they're not making any money at all off of that. So much news. And they go in, and they, and they talk about it, and 
local news picks him up, and then that leads to CNN picks it up. And then that goes to CNN, and it's, eventually it's international news. Obama owes and Captain McCain Crunch. They were the highest viewed news video in the whole weekend of the convention. Besides, you know, just watching the convention. Highest viewed. It is on now. It's on. $40 a box. They made $30,000. Ordering them, people ordering them and delivering them online. Forty dollars a box, made thirty thousand dollars, paid off their credit card debt, but still aren't making money at Airbnb. Having some reservations because it's just a transaction fee is all they would make. It's got to become huge before it makes any money. Well, they get called in, and a friend says, "You need to try this business incubator thing." Okay. Let's go interview. And the business incubator was, after the election in the next year, the business incubator was all about like, getting to in front of the right investors. Of course, investors looked at Airbnb and said, you're staying in a stranger's house. Nobody's ever going to do that. Nobody's going to do that. I mean, I guess people with money who are investors won't do that, right? By the definition, if you're an investor, you probably have money. We're not doing that. So they, they go in and they give this big pitch to the people. Where they're going to give them some office space and, and get them in front of investors and get them capital and coach them. Highly successful people coaching them. And has such a high, high success rate of this business incubator in California called Y Combinator. And so they go in to Y Combinator and the guy comes out and he says, he says you're crazy. This will never work. The main guy who's the successful entrepreneur never worked. So they kind of feel dejected and sad after that. He turns around. He says he remembers in his bag he had a he had a one more box of Obamas. He said, "By the way, I brought you this as a gift." And the guy, the rich investor, says, "What was this?" He looks at it, he reads it, and he, he immediately puts it on his shelf because it's just so amazing. You know, Obama had won by then. Puts it on his shelf, and he said, you sold these for what? You made how much what? Okay, we'll let you know about the business incubator and our investors. Well, the rest is history because they called him the next day and said, it's not really because we like Airbnb. It's because we like you. It's because if you hustled that much and did this and got on CNN International and made $30,000, we don't know about Airbnb, but we like you. You guys are amazing, and if you'll hustle and work and work and hustle and hustle and work and work and hustle like this, you're the kind of people we want to invest in. And the rest is history. Let me show you the next slide. So Airbnb today is a $31 billion value company. That's with a B. $31 billion. And the three guys, including the guy who wasn't even the roommate anymore and just made the first website, are all worth net worth $3 billion each at 31 and 32 and 33 years old. Now that was their goal. How about you and me? It's not my goal to be a billionaire. It's not my goal to start a company like that. But I do have needs, right? And you have needs, right? Do you have tangible, practical needs? Where do tangible, usable, practical resources come from? Well, they come from God, right? They come from God. But besides the sun and the rain and the wind and the dirt, all the rest of them, like all resources are human resources. Have you noticed that? What kind of person 
looks at a 500 limited edition and says, no, 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 no. That's, that means we get to make more money off that. Now, the Apostle Paul is he's a way better entrepreneur than these guys. I mean, we're talking about eternal investment. You know, Bibles with his writing. Billions and billions and billions and billions and billions sold. How long had they known the Apostle Paul's name important to these guys' names? You didn't know their names until I told you today. See, resources come when I learn to listen for hope in the story. Because I'm telling you this story today. And if somehow along the way you started thinking like, wait a minute, this is a good story. Wait a minute, something good's going to happen here. Like, how can I listen for hope in the story? Good is coming. Where's the good? Acts 28. You know the story of Paul. I've been talking about it for about four weeks now, five weeks. And this is Paul who's a prisoner. He's on the ship. And he's the one who knows in his heart and his mind that God is going to save everyone. He is the only one on a ship of 276 people that believes good is coming. And the prisoner, he's in prison for preaching the gospel, and he's lied about, and he's, he's put in chains falsely. If he was not born with a Roman father, he would have already been killed because he could appeal to the, to the dominant government, to Rome. And he was taken to appear before Caesar in Rome. And he's there on the ship, and they shipwreck on this island. And, and, and he's excited because it's happened just as I told you. I believed it. And so... They're there, and it says in Acts 28, verse 7, near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius. A Publius is a Latin um, Roman name, which uh, it means the, the, the leader, the head person of the island. It said, he welcomed us, and, and somebody help, help a little girl out. <laughs> so it says, and Publius' father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in and prayed for him. And laying hands on him, he healed him. Then all the other sick people on the island came and were also healed. As a result, we were showered with honors. And when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. Now this is the same Paul where he says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That was way later when he wrote that to the people in Philippi. He lived it and learned it before he taught it. All he was saying is, I was in chains and I had the resources I needed. I was put on a ship in a storm and I had the resources that I needed. The ship was thrown back and forth and they tried to kill me, but I had the resources that I needed. The ship broke up on a reef outside of the island of Malta, but I had the resources I needed. I was on the, on the beach and there was a fire there and, and we built a fire and a snake attached to my hand, but I shook the snake off back into the fire. They thought I was a criminal. The natives did and were going to kill me because they thought, surely this is the reason why this criminal's here. And when he shook the snake off into the fire because of that stupid, crazy little snake, they said, oh, he must be a god. And all throughout this story, the apostle Paul is listening, God, where's the hope in this story? Because I get the resources I need after I hear the voice of hope that I need. Because if I get the resources without the hope, then I just am hungry for hope again. There's a lot of people who are full in their stomach, but are hungry for hope. But there's a lot of people who are empty in their stomach and are filled with hope. And if I'm filled with hope, I can always get full of the resources God has for me because I'm listening for hope in the story. He said, this same God who put me here shipwrecked on this island, 
This same God who I shook the snake up into the fire. Wait a minute. Are you telling me the father, the father of the, of the leader of the island is sick? Wait a minute. It sounds like a healing is the next chapter in the story. Is anybody with me so far? Amen. There must be a healing in the next chapter in the story. What could he have said? Oh, the guy's sick. He's probably mad. But let's think about this. Now, here on the island, the, the, the father of the, of the leader of the island is sick. Wait a minute. There's always a solution. I don't know what to do. Wait a minute. I always know what to do. Because I have a God who gives me wisdom. But let me listen for hope in this story. Wait a minute, I will thrive no matter what happens. And if I am to thrive no matter what happens, if, that's to, if I'm going to thrive no matter what happens, that means God's going to do something miraculous. And I'm not walking out of the problem, believing that something can happen. I'm walking into the problem, believing there is hope in this story. And all I've got to do is listen for hope because resources come out of hope. First. And it says, as a result in verse 10, we were showered with honors that we didn't deserve. And when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. And when people supply it, there's no tip, there's no tax. You don't have to earn and buy everything God's going to supply for you. Somebody needed to hear that today. Just because you can't earn it, just because you can't buy it, doesn't mean God's not going to supply it. Because you have a God who owns everything. You go to work, you do it all, you invent your own Obama O's, <laughs> you go after it, you blow up that air mattress, you rent out a room, you do everything you've got to do. But don't believe your hope comes from what you can do. Believe your hope comes because you're listening for hope in the course of the story. And you've got to talk to yourself. In fact, you're crazy if you don't talk to yourself. You're crazy if you don't talk to yourself. There's always a solution. I will thrive no matter what happens. I will always have the resources I need to do what needs to be done. Because if I say it, I will see it when it comes. But if I don't say it, I'll be just mad that I don't already have it. Is anybody with me there? If I continually speak my fears about resources, about deprivation, about lack. If I'm always saying, yeah, it's not going to, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. I'm pulling, I'm pulling doubt and depravity from the future into my present experience. But if I say, I don't have it, but I will always have it. Where's my air mattress? Let me blow it up. I don't have it, but I will have it. Let me shake this snake back if I'm under the fire. I don't have it, but I will have it. Uh, is there anybody? Wait a minute. I think there's a healing that needs to happen because I've got a God. In fact, the whole reason that I'm deprived right now is because I need to care about somebody else who needs to be healed. And if I care about them more than I care about me, then God will always supply His riches for me. So you're crazy if you don't talk to yourself. I will always have the resources to what needs to be done. Everybody stand up with me. Do you believe in hope? Do you believe that it matters? That it will make a difference? That every other road is a road that's a dead end? There's two tracks going on in your mind. It's the give up track. There's a give up track that says there won't be enough. Or you can hit the seat button. You can say, let me go on to the next track. Let me go. I don't like that song. Now, I've been listening to that song way too long. Uh, that song is a song of emptiness. That song is a song of lack. That song is a song of deprivation. I will never listen to the song again. The track in my head that says there's not enough. I say there is enough even I don't see it. I am enough even though I don't feel it. And I'm going to go on to the next track, not the give up track, but the keep going track. You will always have the resources to finish the race. So keep going. The last lesson today are these. Don't let what you can't do, ladies and gentlemen, keep you from what you can do. Don't let what you can't do keep you from what you can do. The last lesson is this. Stop waiting for what you want for what you want. And 
start working with what you have. Work it, baby. Work it, work it, work it. Stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. I will always have the resources. Do what needs to be done. Hope with the confident, joyful expectation that good is coming. And so as you stand in that, let's worship God as we close.